Can we talk about how much I hate Save the Tatas? Yes. Uh, can we talk about what that is and why it's so annoying? Is that no? The boobies one is the bracelet. Yeah, I can't. I, don't, I can't either. I don't. And even before I was diagnosed, I that always rubbed me the wrong way. Like I would go to music festivals and they'd be just like passing out these like Save the Tatas and I Love Boobies bracelets and. That money that they're using to sell that is not going to actual research for breast cancer, you know, treatments and things like that, which is so fascinating to me. And that was a lot of what I discovered in the marketing of this stuff when I dug deeper. Where is it going? Overhead for organizations to, like, keep pushing out awareness. (laughs) Oh, no. Wait, really? A lot of it, yes. I mean, I don't want to, like, really drop too many names, but I'm pretty sure everybody knows, like, the biggest breast cancer organization. I'll say it. It's Susan yeah. G. Komen. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, that's on my list, too. So <clears throat> what's the deal with the biggest ones, quote, unquote? I That's really it. I think it was discovered a few years ago that their CEOs were the ones that were, like, being paid this enormous amount of money, which nonprofit CEOs do make a lot of money in the U.S. for some reason. And like some, it makes sense. Some, the overhead is meeting the requirement. There's this like 75% to the dollar sort of average that a nonprofit that's actually effective um, makes. But Susan G was like way below that, what they were actually donating to the cost to the dollar donated. And it came out that it was like all going to the CEO and executive leadership. So, okay, what, what ideally, what ideally would the money be going to? Because I feel like people donate and they think, okay, they, they, what do they think the money is going to, you know? Yeah. So I can speak from my experience at LLS, like having done a bunch of fundraising, we specifically have three pillars. So we have research, patient, patient support and advocacy. So a lot of our money does go to the research. We fund so many researchers that are actually proving treatments to cure and treat blood cancer and beyond. So a lot of the treatments that are originally researched to be blood cancer end up becoming like breast cancer treatments, diabetes treatments, or threat, mm-hmm. like things like that, which is amazing. Um, and the, it, the, the success of that is proved through FDA approvals, which in the past you would get like two FDA approvals a year. And that was something to really celebrate. But LLS has had a hand in funding like 16 of the 18 FDA approvals for blood cancer a year, which is wow. an incredible feat. Um, and then there's patient support, which is something that I benefited from. It's offering patients either like copay assistance, travel assistance. So really that's more the like on the ground, supporting the people in your community type of thing. Um, And then there's a lot of advocacy work to make sure, like, what is the point of funding all this treatment if it's not accessible to people, you know? Mm -hmm. So making sure to advocate for healthcare rights and for insurance companies to cover the cost of um, some people have to take chemo pills for the rest of their lives. And unless it's a medicine that you take in the hospital, some insurances won't cover it. Mm -hmm. So then you're like stuck with this thousand dollar pill that you have to take for the rest of your life. So things like that. Yeah. What I mean, why I always hear from anybody I know who's had cancer that it's such an uphill battle with the insurance companies. What what is that? Why is that a thing? It's like America. Um, Or what are some examples, (laughs) I guess? The biggest example I have is at my ninth chemo. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in the chair getting my treatment and I was experiencing some chest pains, which is not good. You don't, you never want chest pains. If you're listening and you have chest pains, like call your doctor ASAP, even if you don't have cancer, you don't want Mm -hmm. chest pains Um, and and ends up being anxiety sometimes. But um, (laughs) the doctor was like, that's not good. Let's get you in a scan. So I did a scan and it turned out that I actually had blood clots in my lungs, which is very, very dangerous. And we have proof of this, like the scan showed it and Mm -hmm. everything. And so the next step was to get me to the ICU at the hospital. Um, And the insurance told my doctor in that moment, we will not cover her hospital stay unless she takes an ambulance to the hospital. Um, And 
the waiting for an ambulance and the like paper and the the lines you have to cross to get an ambulance to come to the hospital to take you there it was like a lot it wasn't like just call 911 and go Mm -hmm. um and my doctor was fighting with the insurance company for like three hours before I could get to the hospital he was like I will drive her myself like let's get her to the hospital and then I ended up getting stuck with the bill for the ambulance because the insurance company didn't cover the ambulance it was like this whole I could not believe that that was my life in that moment like I'm worried about blood clots in my lungs but they're fighting over an ambulance and and the hospital stay. Wow. So that's so my it, example. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, I've heard hundreds of them. Does that fall under advocacy, trying to help people um, navigate stuff like that? Or even like, you know, if let's say you're out of work or is that part of like the advocacy part of it? I think that really comes with the social workers at the healthcare institution that you're being treated at. 